I'm Barbara Shatera, and I'm, I'm delighted to have um, representatives of the National Weather Service here today. Uh, Robert Haynes and Jessica Storm, very aptly named for this particular <laughs> topic. Um, and um, we're very happy to have them here, and I'll just turn it right over to you so that you can get going. Welcome everyone, um, I'm Jessica Storm. I'm very excited to be here to bring to you all a metaphorical pulling back the curtain on what a weather forecaster does in the National Weather Service. Um, so what is the National Weather Service? So here we have our mission about providing weather, water, and climate data, forecasts, and warnings um, for the protection of life and property and enhancement of the national economy. And we also have a vision to prepare society, um, to ensure that society is prepared for what comes with the weather. Um, and on the right, you see some, um, we have 122, I believe, offices across the country, um, including Puerto Rico, America Samoa. Um, and of course, we're up there in uh, the Burlington office, if you can see it on there. Um, but there are several offices and um, we kind of come to you as your local office for a zoomed-in perspective. Um, but looking in the bigger, bigger perspective of things, across the country we have several regions that make up the hierarchy of the Weather Service. So we are located in Eastern Region, and its regional office is located on Long Island there, but there's also Central Region, Western, Southern, Alaska, Pacific Region. And then in addition to the regional offices, there are also national centers. Um, a good majority of them are in the DC area, um, Climate Prediction Center, Weather Prediction Center, et cetera. There's a few that are out in a couple different spots across the US. The Tropical Prediction Center down in Florida might make a little bit of sense. And the Storm Prediction Center is in Oklahoma, so kind of Tornado Alley, that kind of thing. And then we also have different um, river forecast offices. And you can see the, the boundaries for those are a little bit more squiggly. They're more defined by the rivers and the watersheds of the regions. Um, so ours is the uh, Northeast River Forecast Center, and it includes most of New England, New York, and a little bit into Pennsylvania, New Jersey, as you can see there, based on the rivers and the watersheds. Um, and then you have the many, many weather forecast offices. And ours is up there in Burlington, Vermont. But there's so many scattered about the different regions that discuss river forecasts with different river forecast offices. And we all kind of work together and collaborate to make one National Weather Service. Um, here are some fun National Weather Service factoids. Um, while weather is our mission, our goal, um, only about half of the many staff across the United States and beyond are meteorologists. That's, of course, because it takes more than just meteorologists to predict the weather. We need um, administrative assistance. We need IT people. It's a whole host of people that make this happen. Um, our annual budget, as you can see here, um, for at least uh, uh, year 23, um, but that is really less than a tenth of a percent of the entire federal budget and equates to about the amount that you might pay uh, at a meal at McDonald's um, to fund us, each individual person. Um, and then we have some fun facts. The farthest east office uh, in Puerto Rico, north office in Alaska, uh, farthest south is Pago Pago, and then the farthest west is actually Guam. Um, so weather forecast offices in all sorts of places. But what about here? Um, because the reason there's so many different places with weather forecast offices is because we serve you, we live here, we work here. Um, this is kind of our very focused area. Um, we serve the four northernmost counties of New York as well as Vermont except Wyndham and Bennington. We are the, um, the state liaison for Vermont, so it is important for us to keep an eye on what's going on in those counties as well. But the National Weather Service in Albany actually forecasts for them. Yeah. 
Um, so here's a picture, it's a little bit older, it'll show a newer picture of our forecast office, but this is the operations center, and, and you asked about taking a tour. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of part of what they'd show you, um, bring you in and show you some of our tools on our computers, um, our situational awareness wall, those TVs, looks a little bit different now, there'll be another photo of that too, but this is kind of it's called the operations floor, and it's not set up like cubicles or separate offices simply because what we do is very collaborative. Um, if there's active weather, we're talking to each other, we're giving each other information. One person might be looking on social media or picking up the phone to get reports, and the other person might be warning a storm. So there's got to be that kind of constant communication. So it's a very open kind of floor plan. Um, and of course, like I talked about before, there's several different people involved in the weather service. Um, in our office in particular, we have a senior service hydrologist, um, and then several technicians for software, hardware, an administrative assistant, um, and our observation program leader kind of um, communicates with a lot of the uh, co-op programs, making sure we get uh, weather data and observations in accurately. And this is the newer kind of look of our forecast office. Um, you can see a lot of a lot of screens going on, there's a window, um, and we kind of use that, those TVs in the back to kind of keep our situational awareness up. Um, I think I'll go into that next. Yes, so this is our, our workstation. This is what it looks like when I go into work every day. Um, so we have five screens total personally, but there are, as you can see in the left, um, those TV screens. Um, we'll have on the local news, um, we'll have on webcams, satellites, any sort of situational information we can get to kind of draw our attention to things if we need to be aware that there's snow falling on the marina or um, the weather channel is talking about snow in this spot and it's always important to kind of be aware. <coughs> on the, the computers we have um, in several different screens there's one there is kind of our where we make the forecast and send it out so that it goes onto the website. Um, we also do an aviation forecast um, and keep track of observations. There's a satellite image there, a um, computer model, um, and another kind of way to view a computer model that we'll talk a little bit about in a bit. Um, so forecasting weather is not all we do. Um, we do things like this, um, and we like to talk to people and get the word out, but we also want to um, collaborate with our partners, in particular media partners. Um, so we'll do interviews. Um, with this is WCAX was interviewing one of our lead forecasters about the snowy winter ahead. Um, and they were asking her some questions in our conference room. Um, here you can actually see Robert and I are in that photo. Um, we went to NBC5 to tour their facility and they came and toured ours. Um, and this kind of just helps foster that relationship between the two. Um, it's important to kind of note that we're not, you know, it's not um, a competition really. Um, there's different strengths in different ways and one thing that they're really important to us is that if if we're sending out a warning they'll get it on the TV right away and tell people who are watching and kind of get the word out about the important weather happenings and help us achieve our mission of protecting life and property. Um, and here is one where uh, one of the NBC5 uh, members came to our office to do a simulated severe uh, warning scenario with one of our lead forecasters and so he kind of walked it through it with him and um, Tyler kind of practiced issuing a warning like he would if he worked in the National Weather Service. So kind of just getting that familiarity, getting to know each other is really helpful. Um, we you also... You actually let them do that? It was a practice. Oh. It was a practice, yeah. <laughs> Um, only National Weather Service meteorologists issue the warnings. Yep. Um, so we also study and present the region's weather, um, kind of in a way like we're presenting here, but there's also different um, conferences, um, educational uh, conferences that occur. Um, you can do a presentation or like Robert here is doing a 
poster, talking about a poster um, about non-convective wind gusts. So all of kind of that research and data is on that poster. And so that can be kind of one of the ways we share um, science and local knowledge with the weather community. And here are some of our forecasters um, presenting at something called Women Can Do. It's kind of a young women's STEM um, program to kind of show high school uh, women how to, um, what, what they can achieve in the STEM fields and what they can do. And this is about um, flooding and different things about flooding. Um, we also help the partners plan for weather. So this is one of our forecasters um, presenting, well, not presenting. Um, this is one of our forecasters um, helping the, um, helping a prescribed burn, essentially, sorry. Um, and she's on site there to make sure they have the updated weather, wind direction, if it's going to rain, um, so they can do their prescribed burn safely and so that the weather doesn't change and make conditions dangerous. Um, and there's also, um, this is one of our meteorologists presenting um, a kind of scenario for UVM um, where they practice and say, we present them a scenario where it's gonna thunderstorm on graduation and it's gonna be so hot and unsafe for people. Okay, what are you gonna do now? And so we kind of run through these scenarios with people and help them be weather aware and weather prepared. Um, and then in when the emergency does happen, um, like in the flooding we've had a couple times in the past year, um, the state will open up an emergency operations center and we will be on hand there to give them weather information and keep them informed um, on our side of things, which is weather. Um, switching gears a little bit, have you ever received a winter storm warning? Has anyone ever received one of those? Um, so yeah, this is kind of how we help you specifically. Um, you know, there's partners, there's different different people we talk with, but the public uh, mainly experiences are weather warnings, weather products. Um, does anyone feel like they know the difference between a winter storm warning and a winter storm watch? Because that can be, we'll kind of talk about a little bit about warning and watch um, in the severe sense. It's kind of the same idea um, where the watch is kind of be prepared and the warning is when you kind of take action. Um, and we have up there the VT alert um, because I believe they send them out as well if you need a place to get alerts. Um, but you can also always go to weather.gov. Um, we have all the alerts there and we send things out on social media if you follow us there. Um, but really, how do we know all of this magical weather knowledge? How do we tell the partners what's going to happen? I think some, some preconceived notions happen that we just have it all in our heads and we just sense it and you know, give, give you what's going to happen. And we're not actually fortune tellers. Um, we have a lot of different kinds of um, ways we observe the weather and get the information. And that's what all those screens are for, to get all this data we have surface observations, upper air observations, um, computer models that also ingest all of those observations to become more accurate, um, satellites rotating around the Earth, revolving around the Earth, sorry, um, taking pictures, and of course the radar um, that will give us an idea of precipitation and wind and many, many things. Um, these are actually, this is um, a radio sound. Um, basically, the balloon in that picture there um, that that person is holding, um, it sends up into the air this weather data collector. Um, so this would be attached to the, the uh, balloon? Yep. Yes, it's attached to the balloon, and our, <laughs> our office in particular doesn't doesn't do it um, but in Albany they do it um, the gray main Portland office launches a weather balloon and that helps us get data about the atmosphere um, that we wouldn't otherwise have because it um, kind of takes a profile of the atmosphere so. 
about 115,000 feet. 115,000 feet. 115,000 feet. I get it in the mic. Yeah, yeah, they get really big, and the balloon, and get really high up, and then it pops and it falls to the ground. Yep, but that can help us get, thanks Robert, <laughs> that can help us get um, a lot of data that we wouldn't otherwise get. Um, even like planes, you know, they generally stay at one altitude for a long time, so this can kind of help us get like a geode of the atmosphere. Do planes have to watch out for them? I mean, I know that the planes are much lower, but when they're ascending or descending, I guess. Yeah, for this, there are some upper air sites that are located on an airfield. Um, and so in those instances, um, if it's not a busy airfield, you just kind of look both ways, you know, all right, send this off. Um, but if you are in a more busy airfield, you will call and say, all right, we're, we're ready to release this weather balloon here. Uh, then they can, air traffic control can manage that. Or they can say, hold off about five or 10 minutes if you mm -hmm. could, please. Um, but there is a very narrow window that those things have to be sent out. So after a while, it's like, all right. <laughs> yeah, they, they do get sent out like basically the same time every day. So it's kind of a clockwork and thing. How long are they actually It's about a it's about a ninety minute to two hour journey. Okay, and then when it pops, I mean, presume he's pulling it back to earth. There's <laughs> a parachute. Oh, it has a parachute. It has a parachute. <laughs> and does it like is there? I assume there's like tracking or something, so you know where to go for your bed. Uh, the GPS actually usually breaks with the, the balloon, <laughs> so sometimes we can estimate where it likely falls, but. Uh, usually it's someone random finds them, um, and then there's mailing instructions inside if you do find one, how to refurbish them, but usually, the, like, so all of this equipment is damaged beyond repair, which is why we use it for demonstration, um, but usually they're, they're damaged beyond repair. When so they it's are sort of a one-time use thing? Yeah, usually, unfortunately. Yeah. What's this one way over on the bottom of here? Is that, is that how you guys uh, figure out? If there's going to be like a severe storm, like thunder and lightning, or something like that. So bottom right. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, yeah, right there. Yeah. That is a, a, a satellite image. Oh, okay. Um, that is one of the ways we look at the atmosphere as it's currently um, looking um, to kind of assess severity of, of storms, things like that. Um, we also use a lot of other things. It's all kind of use everything together really helps us understand the severe thorn storms and things like is it, that. Is it safe to camp out in the summertime during the uh, thunderstorm? No. No. <laughs> if, you, if you hear thunder, go indoors. Yeah. Yep. Are the satellites, um, like, are, 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 is the information from those satellites available to, to everyone? Is it like public information or? So every, um, you know, anyone who wants to pick it up, pick it up, they have it. Yeah, the, the way it kind of works is there, there are sites online um, that you can view it on. We have like a satellite dish that gets mm -hmm. the dir data directly in and we can kind of view it and do that kind of thing. But there's, um, even on, if you go to like weather.gov, um, there's ways to kind of see the satellite through there. So they're Do you guys get the weather from the weather channel or from the weather.com? Um, we, we make our own forecasts. Oh. So. Um, and then Channel 3 News and then they, they get it from you guys. Well, they, they can. Um, I can't say what exactly they do, um, but typically, you know, different. If a place has forecasters or meteorologists, they're making their own forecasts and, and doing kind of their own thing. What's, a, what's the difference between ground, lightning to ground, and then regular uh, lightning? Um, typically, lightning that goes to the ground is kind of considered regular lightning by most people, but there is also cloud to cloud lightning. Okay. Um, and that interacts from cloud to cloud. It's mostly the people will know about cloud to ground because that's the most dangerous kind. It can set trees on fire, it can 
hit things on the surface, so people are concerned about that. Well, when the lightning is about ready to flash, how does it go from the sky and then it comes up from the ground? So it, it sends out kind of little, little electric feelers that move too fast for our eye to catch. Oh, yeah. And once it finds a spot to connect, that's when the electricity kind of runs through that channel and completes it. So it's not necessarily that it comes up from the ground, but just that the lightning has found its spot and then the strike happens instantaneously. Mm -hmm. Um, so now, not only do we bring you the weather forecast, we bring you a little bit of weather knowledge for your own forecasting. Um, but just to kind of better understand the weather, um, the sun is where it all begins. Um, we get all of our heat and energy from the sun, and that is what fuels the weather. Um, and as you might know, there's a slight tilt in the Earth's uh, Earth's axis um, and that allows for different spots to be cold and different spots to be warm so like if you go down to Florida that's a little bit more tropical it's warmer all the time they wear jackets when it's 50 and you come up here and it's a lot colder than that kind of a place and so that's kind of the idea where you go south well the same kind of happens with the southern hemisphere where if you go farther south it gets to be colder. So essentially the uh, equator, this kind of middle part of the Earth, gets the most radiation from the sun. It's a tropical climate, it stays warm all year round, while the farther out you get, the less direct the sunlight is, and you might well, have colder areas. Well, down in Florida and Texas and Arizona and California, it stays warm all year round, but how does it get down into the 50s at night in Florida? Um, well, that's the other part of the, the tilt on the axis is that there are also seasons. Um, and as for the nighttime, when, of course, when the sun isn't beating down on the, the ground, it gets a little bit colder um, because that's where our energy is coming from, the sun. So, so it only gets down to the 50 and that's it? Um, it, it can get down to different temperatures. Oh. Also, during the summertime, I heard down in Florida, they get thunderstorms like every afternoon. Yeah, yeah, well, that is another aspect of the, the fact that the more direct sunlight is going to produce more radiation, more energy for the weather. And so these tropical climates tend to have more active thunderstormy weather um, because that radiation is, is really powering um, those thunderstorms. Now, now do they, now, do they get it like in California and stuff too? Or Robert, just down in Florida? Robert, give her some time. She's going to get to that. Right. <laughs> Hold on. I love the questions though. It's good. Um, so, as those kind of different amounts of energy reach our atmosphere and the Earth, um, that's causing kind of differences in land mass, um, air masses. So the Earth really, the atmosphere wants to reach an equilibrium. It wants to balance things out, um, kind of get things back to everyone has an equal amount of weather. But um, to do that, you kind of have to move that colder air and move the warmer air. And that's essentially how weather happens, is cold fronts is kind of the the cold air is moving into a warmer area and displacing the air and giving it lift, which is another key element of developing clouds and weather is lifting air. Um, meanwhile, the warm front, as it moves, it's a little bit slower. It um, kind of slides above the cold air when it meets it. As you might know, the warm air rises, cold air sinks, so they follow their little rules um, as they interact with each other, but that still causes lift and um, generally showery weather. Um, so another thing you might see on um, 
like weather maps with the cold front, warm front, um, is something low pressure. Um, and that is when the warm air rises, surface winds flow inwards. Um, you can kind of picture it like, like a, a low spot with a drain where all the water is kind of flowing into that spot. It's that low pressure where the, the winds are coming in, the air is coming up. Um, and that generally develops the lousy weather, which is cloudy skies, windy conditions, wet weather, colder weather following, things like that. <laughs> You're going to do the tornado? So, yes, we'll do. This is probably the perfect time to do this part perfect. of the demonstration. Uh, the good old tornado in a bottle. So kind of just to, to simulate that idea of that area where all that air is coming together and that lowering pressure, you just have that, that funnel that develops as you... Uh, generate some of that spin in the atmosphere. Used to be a pro at this. Better than me. Well, kind of, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> Tornado! So just to really emphasize that lower pressure. side there's also high pressure, um, happy weather. So the kind of weather you'll go on a walk and enjoy the afternoon outside with clear skies, calm conditions. Um, it's kind of the idea where if you have a toothpaste tube and you put pressure on it, you know, you're squeezing it and so the toothpaste wants to come out. So it's the surface winds are flowing outwards, the cold air is being pressed in um, and you kind of result in higher uh, daytime temperatures, like a warmer day, but it might be kind of cool at night, but generally dry weather, and there are exceptions. It's not going to be true all the time, but these are kind of the general ideas for high and low pressure. Would you like to pick it up from what is weather and climate? Absolutely. All right. Hello, everyone. Again, my name is Robert Haynes. Um, and so now as we kind of go from where we talked about how uh, how climate is, starts from the sun uh, with the uneven heating of the Earth's surface um, and how the atmosphere tries to restore its balance. Um, we'd like to, ex to ask this question, what exactly is the weather in relation to things like climate? Weather is really going to focus on a lot of the day-to-day -day activity saying, all right, that's where that high pressure is, low pressure is right here. How is that going to affect our day-to-day -day sensible conditions? Uh, what kind of temperatures are we going to be feeling? What's the wind like? Is it going to be very gusty or is the air going to be stagnant without any kind of wind? Uh, so we're going to ask questions like are there fronts um, that are going to be generating things like thunderstorms? Um, are we in the middle of a heat wave or some intense cold snap? Um, those are a lot of questions that are related to the weather. Um, and are going to be what's most interesting uh, to people as they're planning their day-to-day -day activities. Uh, when we're talking about climate, um, climate, think of it as a baseline between what the normal conditions are and then weather is the deviation from that point. Um, so weather describes the day-to-day -day conditions often in relation to what's normal for that type of time of year. So naturally, uh, these kind of measures of climate are big 20 to 4 year numbers um, that are averaged all together, um, giving you a sense of what's, what's the, the frequency or return intervals, uh, what's the chance that on any given day, say Burlington, Vermont, gets an inch of rain or six inches of snow, um, or what's the seasonal average like. Um, planetary circulations also fall un into that. Um, so thinking things like the uh, seasons, uh, the polar vortex being one of those big numbers are big things that people think about. The Bermuda High um, is another thing that people often think about. Um, and those are things that are planetary circulations that have very predictable, very um, observable things that happen almost every kind of year. And so you can think of almost at the very core, most basic level, climate change um, describes how those numbers and those averages adjust over time and how they affect regional climate zones. Uh, so they're often, when we're talking about climate, we're often looking at the impact to flora, fauna, um, the, the living situation um, over an extended period of time. 
they can be really packed into small areas. For example, the big island of Hawaii has 11 unique climate zones in the region. Um, I don't have the exact stat for our area. Um, this is not a very zoomed in uh, map of the different regions, but there are a lot of microclimates within the valleys um, of Vermont, um, and there's a lot of cold hollows and drainage basins, especially in the Adirondacks of New York. Um, I like to pick on the town of Saranac Lake as being one of the most challenging microclimates to forecast in our area. Um, so climate looks at these small narrow zones and the numbers that characterize them and the weather is trying to tell you uh, what's the day-to-day -day condition going to be like. Now we've talked a little bit about, have you, we've asked the question, have you ever received a National Weather Service watch and warning? Um, and what does that exactly mean when you receive that information from us? Uh, this is a very weather type world of situations. Um, and do we have any bakers um, out here? Excellent. I enjoy baking myself as well. And one of the best analogies for weather um, is thinking of how we bake cupcakes. Um, and so with a cupcake watch, you have all of the ingredients present. So say like a severe thunderstorm watch, you have the ingredients for severe weather there. But the severe weather isn't made yet, nor is the cupcake made yet. But everything is there on the table ready to be mixed. You have butter, flour, sugar and cream, uh, vanilla and eggs, all to prepare your cupcakes. Once you transition to the warning, uh, that's when you've mixed all of the ingredients together and thrown it in the oven, um, and now you've put the frosting on top and you're ready to eat that cupcake. So that warning phase of a system is when it's imminent, uh, when you can see it. Um, it's basically right there and ready to happen. And so when we're talking about forecasting uh, and what that looks like, um, I have these images of the Mona Lisa that I've taken from the public domain uh, that kind of obscure the Mona Lisa in various ways. Um, you can still realize that, hey, that's the Mona Lisa that I'm looking at. Um, but you notice some of the details are hard to distinguish. It's hard to see the definition of her hands. You can't really see the iconic Mona Lisa smile in this situation. And that's a lot like what is uh, using low resolution models, especially after four days. We see the core details, but some of the more minute things that we have to distinguish, a little bit harder to determine. But we can sort through different weather models and see where they agree or disagree to get a better idea and get a sense of consensus on what, these, uh, uh, what the future weather forecast might look like. Once we get within 48 hours, uh, we're starting to get into the range of high resolution models. While that helps us to see things in great detail, sometimes it reveals some <laughs> disturbing things. And so with this, we have to really pay close attention to fine details as sometimes they can make the difference between a pleasant outcome and an unpleasant outcome. Um, so really when we're talking about the forecast window and why does it change so much, especially four days out, um, it's because we're going from really coarse images to very fine details um, as we get closer to an event. And so now I'm going to put you in the seat of a forecaster and something like what we have to do every day. I have um, on the bottom left here a cold reading of 40 degrees and a warm reading of 50 degrees on the end. Um, and I have different weather models represented by these different letters. Um, we are sorting through hundreds of different weather models on a daily basis, um, but here I've just provided um, a total of eight. Um, and so if you were a forecaster sitting on the desk and saying, all right, what's it going to be for a high temperature today? What would you think would be a reasonable temperature forecast? You can just shout the letter out. The yeah, G. Okay, what made you choose G? Well, there's a lot more on the cold side, so it seems like H might be a little bit unlikely, and G's sort of closer to the cold, but still a little warmer than the rest of them. Yeah, sometimes the outliers can tell you something. Uh, so it's like maybe I shouldn't go completely cold. Um, any other ideas for uh, forecast highs? What, what letter might you choose?
as meteorologists, we're often doing statistics on the fly. And so for us, we like to see where are there clumps and clusters of data. So what might you choose then? Yeah, C or D would be, uh, it would be the natural inclination for a meteorologist to say, that's what we want. There's good model agreement in this space. However, like Barbara was pointing out here, sometimes those H's are telling you something. And so oftentimes we're doing the statistics, but then we're often looking at the weather pattern um, that we're observing with our many, many screens uh, and determining, okay, is, is the median or the mean of this a good choice? Or is there good reason to think that maybe G has a better handle of the situation? Uh, so thanks, that's, that's a little bit of what it's like to be in the uh, seat of a weather forecaster. Now let's look at some of the specific technology that we use. And radar is one of our most well-known and uh, one of my, uh, I guess, well, satellite's my favorite, but it is a very cool piece of technology. Radar spins, um, and each time it is spinning, um, it's slightly changing the elevation that it's scanning in the atmosphere. And with that, you get a lot of important information that is related to thunderstorms. So I'll let that play again. So it starts very low to the ground, and as, it, as time progresses, it heads a little bit higher up into the atmosphere. This has a lot of key uh, details that it provides for us. If you've ever looked at a broadcast, that's showing a hail core and where that is, they're plotting where there's a very high reflectivity based on the fact that this is scanning and giving you almost a three-dimensional model of what the, the, what the thunderstorm looks like. So you can almost kind of picture each scan kind of builds um, something that helps you see uh, where the most rainfall is. And so where there is a ton of red for a lot of different scans, you have very heavy rainfall. And oftentimes it also gives you a clue as to where cloud ice is, which helps us predict whether lightning is about to occur. Um, so if we see what high... Cloud ice, what did you say? Cloud ice. Cloud ice. Yes. Uh, so like once, once you get to a certain point, ice reflects the radar very differently. And so it shows up as very intense radar signatures. Um, and so when we see that above, usually about minus 10 Celsius, since water actually usually does not freeze without cloud nuclei, um, until it, like when it gets below freezing. So usually it's when you get to the, it's about the single digits in Fahrenheit. Um, at that point when we see at that kind of level, those, very, those reds and oranges, that usually is a good indicator, hey, lightning is about to strike um, because there's likely ice in the cloud. Mm -hmm. So radar is really important for us, um, especially sometimes um, and especially sometimes is a great qualifier. Um, sometimes when we're talking with the uh, Coast Guard and they're interested in the thunderstorms that are coming across Lake Champlain, sometimes we'll provide that extra information of uh, there's no lightning out there yet, but some of these thunderstorms are, I mean, showers at this point um, are starting to indicate that they could probably produce lightning. And so radar works by sending a beam out um, and so each water droplet or cloud ice um, will send some of that signal back to the radar beam. Um, and so, of course, if there are a lot of raindrops in the uh, same spot that shows up as those uh, oranges and reds, um, or in the case of ice, usually those purples and beige type colors. And so with that, um, it works a lot like if a, uh, a police officer on the road is scanning your speed, um, kind of the same idea. They're, they're measuring the, the gap and that change uh, from where you are in relation to that Doppler radar that they're sending out. So you can detect things like downburst winds. Um, you can see the direction that those raindrops are traveling and how fast. Um, so we can see, okay, uh, these raindrops being picked up on radar are moving towards us at 60 miles an hour, but also at this spot they're moving 40, uh, more than 40 miles an hour away. Um, so we can use things like the velocity to determine, okay, there is a downburst that has happened in this location because air is moving uh, diametrically apart from each other. Or we can also see areas where uh, wind is rotating uh, based on how these droplets are moving from these radar scans. And of course, hail, uh, since it reflects the radar beam very differently, sometimes it creates weird little errors um, in analysis, like the little spikes that you kind of see on that thunderstorm. 
Um, that's a surefire bet that there's uh, large hail and a thunderstorm. And of course, radar helps us see the storm structure and evolution. And so we can see things like uh, the signature hook echo um, on radar to determine if we have supercells. Um, and it can even see uh, the lofted debris from tornadoes in particularly intense cases. Oh, yeah. What does it mean when you see the yellow and then in the red? Does so, that mean, does that mean thunder and stuff like that? Usually it means some thunder and stuff like that. Um, it's not always going to be the case if that, uh, if that cloud ice is not present or if the overturning of air is not very strong because the separation of charge that produces lightning, yeah. you usually want very fast turning of winds. Um, so use the, at the most basic level, when you see those oranges and reds on yeah. radar, they're just a lot of targets for the radar to catch. So there's a lot of water droplets, or in some cases, a lot of snow. But that doesn't, that doesn't um, make the lightning flash, does it? No. Oh. Well, what does? It's the overturning of the supercooled water droplets and the ice in a cloud. Um, if there's a lot of violent turning, those collisions help to separate those charges. And then, as uh, Jess was describing, uh, they send those feelers, those step leaders, that then make the connection. Uh, but you need the overturning of ice and that collision to help start that process. Um, it's complex. <laughs> it's, uh, lightning formation is, is not easy uh, to detect. Um, satellites, um, this, is an, this is my personal favorite. Uh, satellite helps us detect a lot of cool things, uh, like it helps us to observe uh, the lake ice on Lake Champlain. We have two different types. We have polar orbiters uh, that orbit around Earth's poles. Um, they're very close to the ground, so they're very high resolution in their detail. Um, so they're, you can see the lake frozen, and if you even look very closely, you can see a few rivers frozen in this situation as well. But the thing with polar orbiters is since they go around the poles, they only cover a very small sliver of the Earth at a time. Um, so sometimes they're not available for use um, if they're not over you at the right time of day. The geostationary one, on the other hand, um, is made to match the Earth's rotation. And so its view is over the same spot. Um, at any given point in time. So you, the viewing area stays the same. You don't have to worry about losing uh, satellite just based on its rotation. Um, but to do so, it has to be a little further away from Earth. Um, so the resolution isn't quite as high. Um, both, though, are equipped with scanners that um, detect different wavelengths. Uh, the Earth's atmosphere is, uh, there's all kinds of stuff being radiated out um, over the Earth. Um, and there's some stuff that's caught in the atmosphere and some things that aren't. And so by tweaking those wavelengths, you can see uh, different things like moisture in the atmosphere. Um, you can create um, these visible color spectrums that are really cool um, and detect things like wildfires and things like that. Um, and so we can use them to track on a minute by minute basis um, when we have these uh, special scans. Uh, we can request them for intense weather like hurricanes um, and really hone in on the evolution of systems. Um, so this was Hurricane Hillary in the Pacific, um, and I'll just use the mouse here to highlight how um, just this, uh, this area of particularly intense uh, thunderstorms that was starting to appear on the left side of the scan. Um, so satellite really helps us uh, track thunderstorms, nor'easters, uh, lots of different things, uh, from wildfires to the smoke that they create. Um, satellites have so many uses. Um, probably just one of the most important things as far as observing our climate as well. We have weather stations that are across uh, the world, but they only forecast or, well, observe really at one point. But satellites give you a complete view um, and can measure the Earth's temperature because the Earth radiates out infrared radiation um, on its own. And the satellite can pick that up to measure the Earth's temperature um, without the need of a weather station. Uh, so satellite is really important um, and it probably is uh, one of the most important pieces of technology to expanding our knowledge um, of the Earth's climate. Um, what, yes? Uh, what, what made the eclipse happen? 
Yes, so the eclipse occurred as a result of the moon's orbit uh, coming across the Earth. Uh, we will have a, we'll have a picture of how it looks on the satellite. Um, in fact, uh, the very next one here. Uh, so let's see what it looks like here on satellite. Uh, so with the Earth, with the moon covering part of the sun, there's a shadow that's left on the Earth. Uh, where it's totally dark is called the umbra. Um, and so where, where that happens is not going to be the same all the time because the, the moon, uh, the, its orbit is a tilt. Um, and so as a result, these events are relatively rare. Um, and the moon, of course, is much smaller uh, than the sun, and its orbit is actually also not the same spot every time. Uh, there's going to be a little back and a little forth um, in relation to where the moon is. Um, if it's far, if it's too far, you get the annular eclipse. But if it's at the right distance, like it was uh, just about a week ago, um, you get the situation where um, it casts a total shadow um, as it tracks. Um, its orbit and blocks uh, the sunlight across the area. So, solar eclipse caused by the, the moon covering the sun for a very brief interval of time. Um, this is describing the weather balloon again. Um, as we've answered, uh, it's about a two hour journey of about 115,000 feet. Um, it drifts very far because the winds uh, here on the ground might be just five miles an hour. But the winds where all of these uh, planes are, um, are going to be usually anywhere between 100 and sometimes as high as 200 miles per hour. So they can drift very far from where they are originally launched. Um, so they measure the pressure, uh, the wind, moisture, and temperature. Um, they've been around for a long time. They've been around for about uh, the over uh, 200, well, not quite 200 years, but over 120 years. They help us determine things like uh, where snow or freezing rain is going to, uh, whether snow or freezing rain is going to take place. Um, I'll emphasize this blue line here, which shows the freezing point. Um, and so when you have a very large layer of air above freezing, and then a small area of below freezing temperatures near the ground, and you're going to have things like freezing rain and things like these weather balloons are vital in helping us be able to see and measure that. Models simulate it, but they're not perfect. Um, I think like to think of the Earth um, as many uh, layers of an onion. And the computer models have to do the calculations for each layer of the uh, metaphorical onion as you uh, want. Um, but that requires a lot of computational power. So uh, they can't quite cover every single piece of the uh, Earth's atmosphere um, in the way of an observation like a weather balloon can do. Uh, outside of snow versus freezing rain, it helps us see the potential for dangerous downslope uh, winds, especially um, the poor town of Rutland often has to deal with these situations. Uh, when very strong winds near the surface um, and favorable conditions near the ground help to, to mix these winds uh, towards the area. And so this was on uh, December 23rd in 2022, uh, where Burlington received its second highest wind gust um, in our period of record where we had a 72 mile an hour wind gust uh, happened on this day and using things like uh, these forecast uh, of the characteristic of temperature and dew point and wind in the atmosphere we can forecast that type of detail uh, really useful information from these unfortunately one-time use uh, pieces of technology and they help us of course uh, detect whether there's instability in the atmosphere and that helps us forecast things like thunderstorms as we transition into summer. Here's a look at one of our weather stations, one of those uh, singular point but important for their fact that they are uh, World Meteorological Organization standard pieces of equipment that uh, detect weather information and record it in very high definition for us. There's a wind sensor uh, a temperature, uh, of a thermometer, I should say. Um, and you can see that it is specially sheltered in this uh, encased white, uh, this uh, kind of shell that protects it from direct sunlight as that sunlight will affect the temperature reading. A salometer, important, important for our aviators out there, uh, and that helps to control the speed of air traffic in and out of airports. Same thing goes with visibility, measures a similar type of thing that uh, is important for the in and outs of an airport. And so um, things like the uh, visibility sensor here and the present weather type 
Uh, both use lasers to uh, detect uh, the visibility and the uh, present weather type. I see um, the, the, the alpha way over on the right where it says lightning detection. Yep. Um, and so when there's, a, there's an electrical discharge, if you get three of these sites to locate them, that's, so when you wondered like, how, how, does, how do we know where lightning actually strikes the ground? Um, it's through pieces of equipment like our lightning detection uh, feature. So if it picks it up and you need at least three of these different sensors to pick it up, they triangulate the position. Um, and so that's how they figure out where the lightning has uh, struck. Uh, so you need at least three sensors to pick it up for it to be able to point where lightning actually takes place. The ice accumulation uh, has a layered pan, has like layered pans um, that help to collect freezing rain, melt it, and then measure how much has happened um, in that layer. Um, the present weather type, which uses lasers to differentiate, am I looking at snow or rain? The dew point, which tells us what our uh, relative humidity in the area is, uh, really is helpful for us if fog is possible and things like that. And of course, the precipitation, uh, the rain gauge, um, is there to, to funnel in uh, and capture water falling from the sky. In especially windy climates, they'll have the guard there to help uh, prevent wind uh, bias, um, as strong winds can make it hard uh, for the gauge to catch um, rain when it's blowing sideways, <laughs> in a sense. Um, and so all of this information that these singular weather stations for a point do help us to forecast things like the aviation type stuff. In combination with, again, the weather balloons, their important use here also goes to aviation. Um, they help us detect, uh, with these weather stations on the ground, areas of icing and turbulence. Turbulence is often the result of the difference in wind speed and direction um, as you go from the ground up to where these weather balloons are measuring. Um, are measuring winds. They help us uh, determine things like fog and low ceilings uh, that impact your travel. Um, so if, you are, if your flight is slow to get off the ground, it may be because there's lots of fog or low ceilings, um, that the air traffic is uh, being managed uh, around uh, the speed that's necessary to be able to react um, based on those conditions. Their center weather service units, probably one of the least known aspects of our agency. Um, they are people who coordinate with people like air traffic control and the FAA um, to be able to help uh, safely route planes, especially when they're in the air. Uh, we're often dealing with what happens with planes on the ground. Um, and there's even uh, centers that uh, specifically uh, focus on just what happens with volcanic ash as well. And so, Part of our job is understanding weather, understanding climate, being able to be uh, situationally aware uh, with all of the screens and the technology that we have, doing all of the different outreach events that we do, um, because sometimes we are locked in a room. And so sometimes our knowledge comes from people like you who come to these events um, as well. We pull all of these things together um, and really we try and serve as stewards of our regional climate in addition to the weather forecasts uh, that we provide. And so many times uh, part of our job is also doing things like this, saying, hey, did you know that nine of the top 11 warmest years in Burlington's climate uh, history have occurred in the 21st century? Um, with the top six of those being after 2010, um, or hey, have, we've noticed that there has been a trend towards warmer nights uh, with the number of, or I mean, well, actually, this is, no, sorry, the number of days. I'm thinking of a similar slide that we also have for this. This is the number of days above 85, um, and we're saying, hey, we've noticed a trend that we're observing temperatures of 85 degrees or more uh, on a more uh, frequent basis. Uh, at the Burlington Airport. And so we monitor those, uh, those uh, regional climate informations and observations, um, and we'll often present information that um, suggests uh, some of the changes that are occurring. And ultimately, we pull all this information to protect people from hazards like lightning, uh, flooding, hail, and damaging winds by the, the total sum of all it is that we try and do um, on a daily basis. So that's, that's the core of what we do at the National Weather Service. Um, 
I want to, before we hop into more additional questions, I want to thank everyone for attending here this evening. Um, it's always a pleasure to be able to reach out uh, with the community and talk a little bit about what we do. So thanks for coming, everyone. Thank you. Do you have any other questions about the, some of the stuff that we do? Yeah, that's a really important thing to distinguish. Like, we meteorologists focus mostly on the weather type stuff, but we're so close to the data because we did quality check and place all of that information of those daily observations into a database. We're so close to it that we often try and communicate that information. But we have an excellent state climatologist. Um, so climatologists will study uh, climate and write about the changes that they observe and they're also responsible for the attribution science side of things. Uh, so say like was the July 2023 flood an effect of climate change? The climate scientist or climatologist uh, will go through and determine whether or not based on uh, her understanding and her analysis um, whether or not um, these type of events are from climate change. Our state climatologist is at UVM, Dr. Leslie Ann dupini Giraud. Um, she does excellent and wonderful work, and sometimes we do coordinate with her. Um, uh, I, I sometimes wish she even had more, uh, because she's an excellent resource in describing uh, how our climate is changing here in Vermont. Uh, she writes many, many reports um, on some of the things that she's observing. Um, and sometimes we do get to interact with her and uh, do studies with her, um, because we have a lot of data sets that we can share. To help perform the, the studies. Between you guys at the Weather uh, Center and the folks that look at like Channel 3 News and Channel 5, they're meteorologists. Do you guys both do the same thing or is it uh, different in a way? It is a little different. Uh, so they are they're going to be talking about uh, how weather is going to impact you in that very instance. Uh, they're going to be focusing on just mostly the, the broad day-to-day -day picture of things. Um, they're going to be broadcasting the warnings that we provide um, and everything like that. Um, for us, uh, our job is like that, but we are the people that we talk with are often very different. Uh, we talk a lot with emergency managers, first responders, state and local officials. Um, like So when we set up those emergency operating operation centers, um, we're all congregated into one place and usually our job is how is weather going to ruin your plans for the day um, as far as responding and providing resources to towns uh, that are impacted by significant weather like floods. Do you, do you, guys, do you guys go to those places when they, when they open up the emergency uh, places? Yep, we'll, we'll call that being deployed um, to the centers oh. when that happens. So how are you, how are you working there and then at your desk at the uh, weather center? Computers are, are thankfully uh, great ways to connect. Mm -hmm. And we have multiple staff usually working, especially on busy weather days. So there'll be someone at the emergency center and several people in the office working mm -hmm. together virtually. Now what happens um, if a plane or a flight is getting ready to take off and then all of a sudden a thunderstorm comes in? How, how do they know when to cancel the flight or, or how do they get around, around the, the storm? That'll be a discussion between air traffic control and the, and the uh, Federal Aviation Administration. They'll kind of decide, do we need to divert the plane to another airfield or uh, do we just need to have them circle around for 15 minutes and then they can fly in? Depends on the fuel that they have. And what was your question? Um, I'm just wondering, as meteorologists, if you have um, like the opportunity to sort of specialize in particular areas that are of interest to you, or you know, do you have like particular like subsets of like weather events or types of research or anything that are like kind of your passion? I'm curious what that is. Yeah, 
um, we all can kind of specialize and have certain areas of interest. Um, I'm still a little bit early on in my career and still trying to figure out where I want to head. Um, I mean, even just doing this kind of thing, like outreach is a key part um, that you can kind of specialize in that I'm enjoying a lot. Um, but I also really like aviation weather and like fog. Um, I find the, the microclimates of, of Vermont and New York kind of very interesting. There's a lot of different valleys and a lot of little uniqueness to each spot to forecast. Has, has lightning hit planes before and what have they done? Fortunately, planes are equipped to handle that. Um, they have been struck by lightning many times, um, but they're, they're made so that lightning usually discharges at some point and does not interfere with the equipment on the plane. Can you want to talk about your specialization? Sure. Um, I used to just specialize in winter, and that's what I started with in the start of my career. Um, but since then, I've kind of I've started to kind of change perspectives, and so, I mean, I had the poster of me presenting stuff about wind storms and things like that, and so wind storms are some of my specialty. Um, I call it my wind advisory collection as I've lovingly built up a, a network of every wind event um, over the last 25 years. Um, actually, it's, I think, 27 now. Um, of these different wind events and kind of what happened and some of the lessons that we can take from each one. Um, so I do those, and I've also been doing more with the opposite of winter. I've been doing heat-related stuff um, lately as well. Have you, have you ever seen on TV where these weather chasers, they go out, and they have all these satellites on their top of their vehicles, and they're tracking the storm? What do you think about that? Do you think it's safe, or...? Well, uh, like you mentioned, is it safe? Um, and the large answer is usually no, <laughs> it's not usually safe. Um, but they've accepted the risks of the uh, job that they take. And usually uh, there, there's several that you'll see that they, their cars are battered with hail and they're ready to go out and go to the next storm. That was never kind of my passion or specialty. Uh, I, I, was, I was happy to stick with winter and heat and winds and things like that, um, as opposed to being out in storm chasing. And we're not in the greatest spot in the world for storm chasing either. We have so many trees and mountains, unlike the flat plains. It's really easy to observe storms from many miles away here uh, or there, uh, whereas here um, you can't really see it until like, like just maybe a few miles before you. Um, so uh, storm chasing is not the safest thing, but, but some but people I, love it. But I know no way how you can how you can tell if a thunderstorm is coming is when you see real dark clouds. It's still light, but I mean you see it coming like from this way, going this way. Yeah, that's uh, that's something important to consider. Uh, what's what does the darkness in a cloud mean? Um, so what that means is. Uh, just think about the water droplets that are in a cloud. Um, if there are a lot of water droplets, um, there's more likelihood that all of that sunlight is being absorbed in the cloud. So usually when you see dark clouds, that usually means heavy rain because all of the light going into the cloud is being absorbed by that water. Mm -hmm. So just like the shirt, there's, there's no light going out. Um, and so with water, water droplets, all of that light is staying in the cloud. It looks very dark. Um, so things like hail will also reflect very differently in a cloud. Um, so if you're starting to see blues and greens in a cloud, you're likely seeing some of the light reflected, or I guess I should say refracted, um, by hail in a cloud. Because on one side it can be light bright enough, and on the other side it can be real dark clouds, but also I have seen lightning flashes uh, mm -hmm. And we even have on our cloud chart poster, feel free um, to grab one of those. You are free to take them and they're also fridge magnets um, if you'd like as well next to them. Um, but you also have things like sun halos. Uh, so ice in a cloud will often create these beautiful sun halos. On our eclipse day, there yes. were sun halos, um, which was a very gorgeous sight to see before uh, totality occurring. Um, so things like ice and water will reflect um, or absorb that light. Rain typically does more absorbing than uh, refracting. Well, thank you very much again. Thank you all for coming. Thank you both so much. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks for coming. It was great to have you. Have a good night.